Yeah, let me start the recording. QBA is focused on early stage biotech investment incubation, especially on like uh, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and medical services. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the partners of QBA. I want to thank uh, Emin and Grace for from BCIC for putting everything together, and all of my colleagues from QBA as well, including Dan, Jessica, Eco, and Summer. With your help, none of this would happen. Um, as you know, during the pandemic, uh, the biotech uh, market, the 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 the, uh, 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 the 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 change is huge during 2021 and 2022. But the investment still remains focused on the Sanglad fundamental. Uh, venture raising hit the record highs, driven by uh, lofty startups in valuation and fast M and A and IPO activities. A new venture funds to have uh, Bautech almost doubled 2020's record in 2021. Uh, today we have five very promising startups that are going to uh, give presentations later. Looking forward to some brilliant ideas and uh, products. Each company uh, will have 25 minutes to present, which is followed by a, a five minute Q&A. Uh, during this event, audience are welcome to use uh, uh, the chat box to ask any questions. Uh, thanks for participating for the um, investor from both the United States and China. Thanks for coming. Okay, let's get started. Um, the first company is going to be uh, Osmo. Osmo Therapeutics developed a treatment to prevent uh, to prevent CIPN. The approved treatment uh, with uh, OSM0205 uh, uh, pr uh, prevent the neuronal damage from the toxins in mice by preventing the off-target intracellular uh, calcium surge caused by these uh, chemotherapy agents. It is hypothesized that the OSM0205 in patient will protect neurons from damage leading to uh, reduction of CIPN. So uh, let's welcome the team uh, for Osmo. I think it's uh, Robert, right? Um, Bob? Yes, yep, Bob, Bob yes, yes. Be presenting. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, uh, Michael. And I wanna thank Cubay for the opportunity to present tonight uh, and this morning. Good morning and good evening. Um, I'm Bob Linke, CEO of Osmo. As, as Michael mentioned, we are a spin out of Yale University developing a novel treatment for chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, but we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, with me on the call is a scientific founder and professor at Yale, Dr. Barbara Ehrlich, as well as uh, Art DeSillis, our chief medical officer. And Art, if you wouldn't mind keeping track of any questions that come through the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as soon as I find the, get my oriented here, get oriented so I can, there we go. So I always like to start out with the team. You can see uh, Barbara, Art, and myself here. Uh, together, this group, a uh, very experienced drug development team. Together, we have over um, 125 years of drug development and commercial experience. Um, that includes oncology products, CNS products, as well as repurposed pharmaceuticals, which we are a repurposed drug. This team with our partners can take the product from where it is uh, at the about to file an IND through clinical development through, through uh, approval. <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about CIPN to start. Um, a big problem in oncology, um, no approved treatments for CIPN today. And, and it's it's characterized by tingling, pins and needles sensation, burning numbness. As the, as, as the problem advances, suddenly you can't uh, tie your shoe, button your shirt, difficulty walking, and actually can be disabling. Um, we estimate there's about 360,000, and, and, our, and our drug works with those chemotherapy agents that have microtubule disruption as their method for killing cancer cells. Our initial focus is the largest of that group, the taxanes. And we estimate there's about 360,000 patients in the US and EU that get taxanes every year. And our initial focus is the biggest of these groups, breast cancer, um, where the incidence rate of CIPN is as high as, um, as, high as 80%. Um, I know we have a lot of China uh, 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 investors here. We are still assessing the, uh, the, 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 the China opportunity. So the numbers you see tonight are not gonna include China. We're still trying to understand the significant opportunity there, but taxanes are widely used in China. Um, and we think there's a, there's a big CIPN problem there, but we are still evaluating that. Um, so given there are no approved treatments, uh, doctors and patients have only one option. Um, you can either reduce the length or the dose of chemotherapy, potentially per, per, uh, affecting outcomes, a, a scenario that, that uh, patients and clinicians loathe. Um, 
So let me talk a little bit about our drug, OSM 0205. What we do is we deal with the off-target toxicity that causes this peripheral nerve damage. We protect neurons by preventing the cal intracellular calcium surge that this off-target toxicity causes. Dr. Earl is going to talk about that in a moment. Um, Pre-treatment will not only potentially help uh, you know, eliminate CIPM by preventing it, but also allow patients to complete their, their chemotherapy treatment and potentially improve outcomes. So our product is a novel formulation of an existing CNS product that really enables use here. Um, as a result, we'll, file, we'll follow the very efficient 505B2 pathway. And we believe there's high confidence, we believe there's a high confidence of clin clinical success here given uh, Dr. Ehrlich's work in mouse models of both CIPN and the associated central nervous effect, uh, chemo brain. Mechanism of action is well understood. We actually have some clinical data that supports um, the hypothesis and our active agents, which we, which we can disclose under confidentiality, has actually been used uh, um, for over 70 years. And what's important with repurposed drugs, there needs to be very significant barriers to generic intrusion. So physicians won't use the generic products that's out there. There is, a, there is an oral form of our drug available, but in its oral form, it really isn't appropriate for use in this indication. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. So I'm gonna turn things over to Barbara to talk about the mechanism and some of the data that she has generated supporting the, the potential of this in, uh, for, to treat CIPN. So um, we'll start with the paclitaxel, which is uh, one of the taxanes that we use and um, it can cross the membrane because it's a, a lip, lipid soluble protein, a molecule, excuse me, and it binds to neuronal calcium sensor one, which is the calcium binding protein. And when uh, paclitaxel is bound to NCS1, it then, uh, more robustly binds to the IP3 receptor. Normally, NCS1 binds anyhow, but um, it is more robust when um, paclitaxel is there, and that causes a calcium surge. And that calcium surge then turns on calpane, which is a calcium activated protease. And when that protease is activated, it um, destroys a bunch of proteins, including NCS1, and it's the loss of these. Um, molecules inside the cell that cause the uh, dysregulation of nerves and the, the, the downstream, uh, effect, the behavioral effects. So the next slide is, shows, and when we add our drug, it actually um, blocks the surge of calcium. And when you block the calcium surge, you then don't turn on calpane, you don't destroy any of the proteins in the cell, and therefore the um, neuronal integrity is maintained. So we're upstream of all the other mechanisms that you might have heard about. So, um, and of course we have, the next slide shows that we have um, uh, behavioral experiments. So the solid curve is what happens when you treat a mouse with uh, paclitaxel alone. And this is using a rotor rod, which is a log roll test. And it's uh, got both a cognitive and a sensory um, component. And they, these mice that are treated with paclitaxel can't uh, feel their paws, so they fall off the rotating rod and they actually don't learn very well. If you pre-treat with our drug, they, um, the dotted line, the dashed red line, um, they continue to stay on the rotating rod and they, over this is over weeks, they, um, they learn how to stay on longer. And this dashed line is um, exactly what a, um, normal mouse, untreated mouse looks like. So, so we can prevent, okay. So then this is a, like I said, a mixed assay. So we also have experiments where we did nerve conduction in the tail of a mouse and the drooping curve is the paclitaxel only. And if you use our drug alone or our drug um, with paclitaxel or just um, control, you see there's no loss in the amplitude of the action potential um, amplitude. And to show that this is uh, relevant to peripheral neuropathy, these are not our data. These are data from uh, in humans from the literature. And as you increase the grade in neuropathy, which is grade, grade three is the highest neuropathy, you can see that the amplitude of the um, action potential is diminished. So that's exactly what we see in the mouse. The next slide, not only do we have these behavioral and um, electrophysiology experiments. We've looked at um, histology and the central panel is um, 
the nerve bundles that have been treated by with paclitaxel, and you can see that the, um, the there's demyelination and the there's vacuoles vacuoles that are um, in these. And what you don't really notice is that the non-myelinated nerves are diminished in number, whereas on the far right. These, these um, have been pre-treated with our drug and you can see that things look very normal. And in fact, the non-myelinated nerves are preserved. So not only do we have behavioral, but we have histological uh, support for the fact that our drug prevents the loss of neuronal uh, function. Next slide. And of course you have to make sure that you don't um, destroy the ability to shrink the tumors. So, um, this, these are experiments that were done by Charles River, thanks to the Yale Cancer Center. We did these in my lab also, but uh, this is the Charles River. And what they do is they you give um, a mouse a tumor and the black dots are the untreated um, mice and their tumors get so large, they have to be sacrificed after uh, 30 days. And um, the red, the green and the blue curves are paclitaxel alone or paclitaxel with our drug, and there's no difference in the ability to shrink the tumors. And we've also uh, shown this histologically so that we know that we can separate the side effect from the ability to shrink the tumors. Next slide. So um, because it's a drug that's been used um, for other purposes, we did a retrospective chart review at the uh, VA hospital in West Haven, and we had 110 patients that were treated with um, paclitaxel without a drug that binds to NCS1, and 40% uh, of these patients had paclitaxel-induced um, neuropathy, and we believe this is an underreported symptom, so we think this is the lower end, and we had uh, four patients that were being treated with um, the oral NCS1 target agent, and none of these patients had any um, uh, CIPN, so that it's a underpowered, but uh, zero is still an impressive number. So next slide. So then uh, we wanted to see if our uh, mechanism was also um, appropriate to looking at chemo brain, whether the neurons in the CNS were the same as the peripheral nervous system. And uh, chemo brain is uh, a symptoms or a situation where patients lose their, what they call um, their executive function. So it's a um, um, managing schedules and complicated uh, tasks. And there's, um, it's basically called a brain fog. And the next slide shows that what we did is um, we did in mice, we um, used what's called the displaced object recognition test. So you put a mouse in, the, uh, in a box for um, 10 minutes, then you uh, send them home for overnight and then you bring them back and there's two objects in the box and they get five minutes to explore. And a normal mouse will explore, we'll look at both um, objects, you take them out of the box, and then uh, for two, hour, two hours later, you move one, one of the objects, and um, then you um, give the mouse a chance to explore again. And a normal mouse will spend much more time, as shown in the black and gray curves, uh, much more time with the displaced object than with the familiar object. And if you look at the orange curves, or orange bars, the, the the paclitaxel treated mouse does not distinguish between the, the um, displaced and the familiar, they've forgotten. Whereas if you pre-treat with our drug, they look like the wild type or uh, untreated mice. So we can prevent that. And the next slide, we've also looked at the histology. The turns out the uh, dendritic arbor, um, we're not showing that right here, but um, that it becomes less complex. And then these are looking at the um, uh, synaptic um, boutons and in the paclitaxel treated, which is the one where um, Bob is having the arrow, you can see there's fewer of the uh, spines that are um, on the dendrite. And if you pre-treat with our drug, which is on the far right, you um, preserve the um, these uh, spine density so that, again, we have um, 
histological and behavioral data. For, uh, and we, we've also done biochemistry to show that the CNS has the same uh, behavior as the um, peripheral nervous system. And the next slide is back to our model. So this shows the, our model where we have um, uh, NCS1 being the um, target for paclitaxel. And then when our drug um, is added, you no longer get the calcium surge and you can prefer, preserve both peripheral and central nerve integrity. And I believe now it's on to Bob. Yes, thank you, Barbara. I'll come back in. I wanna talk a little bit about the market research that we've done. Um, uh, we did actually surveyed uh, oncologists at leading US cancer centers, as well as payers uh, covering 100 million lives here in the United States uh, to really better understand the problem, as well as get feedback on our product. Um, and they confirmed that indeed, there's a tremendous need for um, for preventative treatments. And again, these were breast, uh, breast cancer specialists. Um, and they confirmed that indeed there is no other option other than to discontinue the taxing uh, to, pre to prevent or, or stop the CIPN. We reviewed our target product profile with these physicians and payers, uh, and they were all enthusiastic about our product based on the, re even if we could re reduce on a relative basis, CIPN 40 to 60%, they said they would use it with all of their patients. Then we actually took them through the scenario, would you use a more expensive IV formulation of this active agent when there's an inexpensive oral form out there, given there, and we took them through the use scenarios. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a, there, there are a number of disadvantages of the oral form, and they, to a physician, said they would not put their patients at risk with the oral form, given the toxicity, side effects, therapeutic index, and the cumbersome nature of the, uh, of the oral form. Um, we essentially got the same answer from payers. Um, they, uh, they said, uh, given the tremendous unmet need, they wouldn't put up any barriers to prevent use. And they thought in the US, reasonable pricing would be, uh, would be up to $1,500 per infusion. And again, they also said uh, they would not encourage physicians to use the oral product, again, not, so as not to put patients at risk. In terms of intellectual property, we've filed IP in the three major markets in the US, EU, and China. They've, they've actually issued in the US and China. Uh, we're going through an office action in the EU and new patents will be filed once we are in the clinic and we understand dosing and dosing algorithms associated with our product. Now I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about generic uh, intrusion because this is very important for a repurposed pharmaceutical. As I mentioned, there are, ad there are advantages of the IV form that enable use in this indication. And it's because we can get to the target concentration immediately. With the oral form, you have to start dosing the patients four to five days prior to each chemotherapy infusion to achieve the target concentration, resulting in much more drug. We can also personalize the approach, giving the exact amount of lithium of, of, of our, of our uh, product that we, our active agent, um, that is required based on either body weight or surface area. And we em eliminate the inherent variability of uh, PK variability of oral products. And this IV form also fits very well with the work, workflow of the oncologist, given they give IV uh, pretreatments as well as IV uh, chemotherapies. They get reimbursed um, in that way, and it also addresses compliance issues. They know when they give their, their pre-medication, their, their, their pre they've got the right dose on board right before the infusion, so the patient's ready to get their chemotherapy and be safe. There also is a great deal of baggage that comes with the oral product. As I mentioned, you have to start dosing at least four or five days prior to the chemotherapy infusion. So the patient will be exposed to at least 10 times more, uh, more active agent, uh, adding significant, potentially significant AE risk. And then you've got the whole issue of adherence. Will the patient take enough medication to be protected prior to, or if they take too much, it could be toxic. Um, and this, because this drug has a very narrow therapeutic window, it actually, per the label, requires therapeutic drug monitoring. So the patient and clinicians would have to go through at least two rounds of therapeutic drug monitoring prior to each infusion to ensure they're in the, in the target, uh, target concentration. And again, feedback from oncologists after comparing these two options in terms of uh, delivering the active agent, they said they would not prescribe the oral form given the risks and burdens to patients. 
Let me talk a little bit about our development program. Um, we've, we've confirmed with the FDA, we just had, got feedback through a type C interaction with them last month, uh, confirmed our, our phase one and phase two programs. Um, and we are now in the, in the process of completing our IND enabling studies uh, and uh, plan to file an IND in Q1 of 2023. This is our development plan. Um, as I mentioned, we've got uh, this, the, the, the RAT study is actually complete. We're waiting for the final report. Uh, we'll have uh, our, our active agents API available to support the phase one study by the end of the year. Plan is to file the IND in, in Q1 uh, and then have a, uh, initiate our phase one study, a, bio, a relative bioavailability study where we'll compare our drug to the oral form to, uh, to, to determine the, the relative bioavailability and pick the dose that will then go into phase two studies. For, um, so this financing is a, is a $4 million financing. I'll get into a little more detail in a moment, but our financing currently would support the phase one study, a 26 week rat study required to support our phase two study in metastatic breast cancer patients, as well as manufacturing of drug for both our phase two studies. Phase two program would include a, uh, again, a, metastatic, a, a, a study in metastatic breast cancer patients, as well as an early stage uh, study or an early, early um, disease study in, um, in Germany in breast cancer patients. So in terms of what we've achieved this year, earlier this year, we closed a $5.2 million financing led by COAX Investment Partners. They are a, a fund that was formed by the founders of Biohaven. Um, we completed our preclinical studies, as I mentioned, the API synthesis, um, uh, we've actually made our demonstration batch and they're in the process of making the GMP batch right now, um, received feedback from the FDA and actually submitted a, a, a phase two, uh, a, a, an SBIR grant for $2 million to potentially support our phase one study. And then finally, we're very pleased that um, uh, this summer, Teresa Batetti, the, the president of Takeda Pharmaceuticals Global Oncology Business, uh, agreed to join Osmol's board of directors. She's been a great addition to the board. Here's a little bit more detail on our grant submission. Um, we submitted that last month. So we should expect uh, to, to hear whether that grant will be funded sometime in Q1 of next year. Let me talk a bit about market potential. Again, these numbers don't include China. Um, this includes the 360,000 patients that I talked about early in the presentation in the EU and the US. If you assume a $1,500 uh, price here in the US, you can see that um, the, the, the potential in the US and the EU just for taxanes across um, all the cancers, breast, lung, prostate, ovarian, and pancreas could be a $5 billion potential market. If we were to penetrate 25% of that, this could be a billion dollar drug. And there is growth potential beyond these numbers. Um, um, there are other microtubule based uh, chemotherapies, the vinca alkaloids, the apothalones that aren't included in these estimates. And we haven't included China yet. Uh, we're, we're, we're still assessing that opportunity, but, but believe it is very significant. Uh, in terms of value, I wanted to give some sense of, you know, uh, comparable companies. There are two actually that have, um, have recently gotten approved their only, their only product, uh, a, a, a supportive care product. Uh, G1 Therapeutics uh, last year got their chemotherapy-induced myelosuppression product approved. They're a public company, uh, value over $500 million. And literally just last month, Fennec Pharma, um, a, uh, another uh, company with a, with a single repurposed drug like our, ours, uh, is addressing a very, very small pediatric population for platinum-induced ototoxicity, about 5,000 patients a year. And you can see their market cap is, is over $200 uh, million. And there's another company that we've had discussions with because particularly G1 and Tercera could be potential partners and or acquirers of our technology as we advance into the clinic and they look to expand their product lines. We've had discussions with both G1 and Tercera and they're interested in continuing those discussions once we get into the clinic. A little bit about our financing. Again, we're seeking $4 million to essentially fund our phase one study and the two studies required to be in a position where we could begin our phase two program early in 2024. Um, again, it's the manufacturing, the 26 week tox study, as well as um, uh, a phase two study. We've got a small commitment to the round, uh, $325,000. Uh, 
that uh, that is that has been confirmed, and a term sheet is available for review uh, to interested investors. And you know, given all the uh, the, the the China uh, uh, representation on the call, I do want to mention that we are very interested in bringing our product to China, and would be looking for uh, support in China to help us do that. Um, and, and leverage our work here in the China market. You know, uh, we've, uh, we, from our work that we've done, breast cancer is a big problem in China as well, and taxanes seem to be very broadly used there. And again, we're still trying to quantify that, that specific opportunity. So we are seeking a co-development partner in China that could help us bring our product to the, uh, to the Chinese population. And I'll end by putting up our science advisors. Um, uh, this is a group of, of, of leading U.S. Uh, clinical researchers in breast cancer and chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Thanks, Bob, for the presentation. That's a really wonderful talk. If there are any questions, you can um, simply raise your hand or um, put that in the chat box. I can, I can read it for you. If you raise your hand, I can probably unmute you so you can speak directly. Okay, we have a question asking you about the potential target of S uh, OSM 0205. It's asking, um, do you know the MOA, like the um, target proteins? I'm gonna I'm gonna let the expert answer that one. Barbara, do you want to take that? Yes. Um, so as far as we know, it binds to or it provides. It, it modulates the interaction between neuronal calcium sensor one and the IP3 receptor. So it's a, um, it's a modulator of this release of calcium. And we've done this, uh, these experiments in, um, from looking at the molecules up to uh, cells. Yeah, I think the question is probably asking, are there any like biochemistry evidence to show the like, Using pur purified protein, saying, "Okay, this is a yes, a yes, small molecule right. that is targeted yes. on the yes." I, that I've done those exp experiments. We've done uh, um, tryptophan fluorescence binding, and we've done uh, NMR. NMR, okay, yeah. And there is a question is asking for. Um, uh, how how do you confirm the protection with the neuron cells? Like um, how I think I think it's probably asking like how uh, do you confirm this? Uh, is there any biochemistry data to show um, like the immunohistochemistry to to show the staining, um, new in stuff like that? Is there any evidence? So we've done experiments. So we didn't show this right now here, but we can show that um, when you isolate neurons from the mice that are treated with paclitaxel, we can show that the neuronal integrity is maintained by pretreatment. So that, I don't know, you go back. Yeah, so that, that would, that there's the histology in the, um, the, here's the, that's the electrophysiology. This is the histology showing that the neuronal integrity is maintained. We've done experiments using Golgi stained um, sections of the brain showing that the uh, complexity of the neurons is maintained as well. Yep, I think it's quite clear data. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Um, we got a question for um, for uh, the time window for a potential drug to be used when a patient is under um, chemotherapy. Are any patient willing to pay this um, preventive drug? Talking about let, the payment. Let me, so I, I guess I didn't explain, this drug would be administered 30 minutes prior to each chemotherapy infusion. And in our research, um, you know, here in the United States, these drugs would be covered by by the patient's insurance. And um, speaking to payers, given the significant problem that they see, and, and it was interesting, uh, I was surprised to see that the, the payers that we spoke to actually were very aware of the chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy problem and all the costs that they were seeing hitting their health plans. 
So they were very interested in getting something into the marketplace that could uh, that could prevent the disease and prevent all these costs that they're seeing going to their uh, to their health plans. Okay. We have not surveyed we have not surveyed patients if they would be willing to pay for this out of pocket because here in the U.S. it would be covered by insurance. Okay, due to the time, um, we have last question. The uh, last question is asking for, will the OSM0205 also block the calcium surge of normal cells and influence normal function? Is asking the toxicity. So the, um, so the issue is that there will be, the, the OSM0205 does have effects on normal cells, but the um, time that the, OSMO205 is present is only during the, while well, the chemotherapy is present. So you only give it um, once a week or whenever the uh, chemotherapy so that the effects actually are not noticed in the normal cells. It, it's um, unnoticeable as far as- And, and again, it's a modulator, not a, not a blocker, right, Barbara? It's a modulator. So it, it has modest modulation when with, without the um, taxing, but it's uh, so modest that it doesn't change the normal function. Okay, uh, due to the time, if you have any more questions, welcome to um, connect us. We should have the email address in the chat box. Um, we will probably connect you guys with the, uh, the team, uh, Osmo team, Great. anytime. Great. So thanks a lot for, for your presentation. It's really nice talk. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Appreciate uh, your, your time and attention and great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Keep in touch. Okay. All right. Um, the next company is going to be uh, Cyto, uh, Cytosolix. Cytosolix develops novel oral and uh, IV derivatives that uh, target tumor and um, acidity to the, improve the efficacy of small molecule cancer therapy, uh, therapeutics. Um, and also, um, uh, uh, Cytosolix uh, tumor activated permeability system um, produces the, 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 the weekly acidic derivatives of known oncology drugs. Um, right now, the, the team is going to talk about it. I think it's um, Colin, right? The CEO and chairman is going to talk about it. Uh, so Colin, are you, um, you can unmute yourself and uh, flush yours. So John Deacon here, oh, John. Uh, scientific yeah. founder, and uh, I've got here with me Colin Foster, co-founder, um, who brings in his expertise as former uh, CEO at Bayer. So together we're nucleating this team. Uh, so at Cytosolix, uh, we're optimizing known drugs for cancer by targeting uh, what we've realized is a universal feature of all solid tumors, which is acidity. So I invented this platform at Yale uh, in the lab of Don Engelman, who's one of these a few people who have been focusing on this target. Uh, he's pioneered targeting tumor acidity as a biomarker for cancer. Uh, and uh, we've nucleated this team with a really world-class group of advisors around us, uh, including current and former pharma leaders, uh, as well as uh, a, a team of uh, uh, consultants who have decades, if not centuries of expertise developing similar drugs. Uh, so we're developing a platform that disrupts the current paradigm for how oncology drugs are designed. Um, what we're doing is we're taking known drugs that have dose limiting toxicities and we're making a small change. We're just replacing variable groups uh, in those structures with our proprietary uh, ionic, what we call TAP groups. Uh, and this allows us to target the drug specifically to tumor acidity in the body. Uh, and in this way, we're allowing ourselves to enhance efficacy by avoiding toxicity. Uh, the approach we're taking maintains the original drug's activity uh, and enables significantly higher dosing um, by reducing the toxicity, producing first-in-class opportunities, best-in-class opportunities, uh, and enabling new drug combinations by disentangling overlapping toxicities. The approach is applicable to about 95% of existing small molecules in oncology, uh, and it covers a broad range of drugs uh, from those that are already approved to those that are stymied in development due to toxicities. 
Importantly, uh, our approach is the only orally compatible platform that can target drugs to tumors, and that makes us the only technology capable of enabling certain drug classes where uh, on-target toxicities are just too much to get a therapeutic index. <clears throat> so we have proof of concept data in vivo demonstrating the platform's capabilities. Uh, in fact, we see over 30-fold improvement in tumor accumulation versus uh, the, the key organ systems uh, that the parent drug uh, reaches dose-limiting toxicity in. Um, and all of the findings we've had align very well with a wealth of supporting data from the literature. Uh, we've now signed a term sheet uh, for our seed round, which will deliver lead candidates for our first three lead products. Uh, and we will, uh, we're just starting out looking for additional investors for participation to fill out that round. So we're targeting tumor acidity. Uh, tumors generate in this acidity mainly as a result of their glycolytic metabolism, uh, also known as the Warburg effect. Uh, and this accumulates acidity outside of the cell, most strongly immediately outside the cell membrane. So this produces a unique microenvironment in the body uh, as tumors are the only blood exposed acidic tissue. Uh, that means they're the only tissue that's acidic and will see drugs in circulation. Recent work has shown that this acidity is pervasive throughout tumors across uh, the whole cross section of the mass, um, independent of size, stage, indication, uh, and we've seen it strongly even in submillimeter metastases. So we're hitting all of the necessary uh, targets in the body to get to outcomes. Uh, modern techniques have also revealed that this tumor acidity is far stronger than previously thought. This is why the opportunity is still sitting here even after 100 years of knowing that tumor acidity exists. Um, this acidity is around pH 6, which is significantly more acidic than um, the uh, previously understood uh, range from old technologies that didn't accurately measure the pH. Uh, it significantly differentiates it from healthy tissues, which are a basic pH of 7.4. And we know that tumor acidity affects drug efficacy for any drugs that contain weak ions, uh, as work in other labs have shown that just a small increase in tumor acidity can double the efficacy of uh, a weak acid chemotherapy uh, and reduces the efficacy of weak base chemotherapies. And this is further supported by showing that reducing tumor acidity can double the efficacy of weak base drugs. In each of these cases, uh, this is by impacting the amount of drug biodistribution into the tumor. And now just recently, our antecedent technology from uh, our same Miel lab, which is a peptide-based platform that targets drugs to this tumor acidity, but requires injection uh, due to its peptide uh, nature, uh, has demonstrated tumor acidity is an effective target in human cancer with success in their first clinical trial. Uh, so this paves the way for us and our technology to expand the sorts of improvements we can make with tumor-targeted delivery across the landscape of oral oncology drugs. So our drugs are weak acids, uh, and these target cancer cells via two principles. First is ion exclusion. Um, since only the neutral form of a drug uh, can get across the nonpolar membrane barrier uh, and into the cytos cytosol to affect its target, whenever the drug contains a weak ion, um, these are commonly engineered into drugs to improve solubility, for example. The pH outside of the cell can affect the drug's charge and therefore which cells it can permeate into, such that weak bases will tend to be charged around acidic tumors, uh, and therefore they're somewhat tumor evasive. Uh, while weak acids will be charged and cell imper impermeable in circulation, but then neutral and cell permeable uh, around these acidic tumors. So drugs in the body will bounce off of cells around which they're charged and accumulate in cells around which they're neutral, which sets up a tumor-specific biodistribution for properly tuned weak acids. So it seems from this like weak acids would be the obvious best case for oncology, yet there are only two approved weak acids in all of the currently approved oncology drugs. And that's not because they don't work, but it's because for years tumor acidity has been underestimated and so all drugs have been screened uh, using cell assays that are measuring to uh, uh, activity these drugs at tissue culture pH 7.4. And as you can see, that will make uh, weak acids appear artificially weak. And that's irrespective of their activity in the actual physiological environment. So once inside the cell, we have a second feature um, that produces an extended tumor exposure and retention uh, after systemic clearance. This is ion trapping. Since the inside of the cell is tightly maintained at a basic pH, that drug 
uh, the weak acid that has gotten in is now going to be trapped in this acidic environment in its charged state. So while traditional drugs will clear out of the system uh, and there'll be an equilibrium intracellular and extracellular, uh, ours will remain trapped inside of the cell uh, and dwell for a lot longer than a traditional drug. This sets up a far different target product profile for our drugs than uh, a traditional drug would. Uh, so the problem we're addressing is that oncology drugs uh, efficacy are limited by their systemic on-target toxicities. So for a traditional drug, the paradigm requires them to have broad systemic distribution, long systemic dwell time, so that they're maintaining concentration in the tumor uh, where they're trying to deliver activity. Using our approach, we are able to, through ion exclusion, keep it out of healthy tissues while accumulating in the tumor. And through ion trapping, it stays there long after systemic clearance. So now we can get a truly tumor-specific uh, activity, both through distribution and then the lingering uh, effect of the drug. So this tremendously expands the therapeutic window. Um, and these tar the, the target product profile and these features that we've shown um, are able to deliver significant improvements in target saturation since we can dose higher. Um, we can maintain that target saturation for longer because we're able to dose as frequently as we need to. And we can avoid drug holidays. So in these three ways, we're overcoming important limitations uh, across the landscape of oncology drugs. So we de we're deploying these principles in a platform we're calling Tumor Activated Permeability or the TAP platform, which is based around a library of novel acidic moieties that are tuned to discriminate between healthy and tumor pH uh, by tuning the pKa. We modify existing drugs. For example, here we show osimertinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor used in lung cancer. Um, we identify variable groups within the drug, often solvent exposed areas uh, that are separate from the active structure of the drug. And we replace these frequently basic uh, uh, variable groups with our weekly acidic TAP groups. This preserves the drug's function in this target uh, and produces a novel tumor targeted distribution. So we filed IP covering the platform's composition of methods, uh, covering TAP drugs produced by the platform with additional NCE composition of matter filings as they're developed. The platform's key compositions, as I just said, were are this library of novel weak acid structures that we've tuned to optimize tumor-specific cell permeability. Uh, we're guided by Henderson-Hasselbach uh, equation and uh, validating cell ex experiments. Um, and this has let us determine the optimal pKa range uh, for discriminating between tumors and healthy tissues. And we have covered the landscape of structures uh, that can be tuned into this range of acidity by uh, an extensive uh, synthetic chemistry and analysis uh, uh, work. And this gives us the only useful library of proprietary tap group structures. So we're able to operate alone uh, going forward in this field uh, that we're developing. We add these TAP groups into drugs in a traditional lead optimization approach. Uh, this ena enables us to only minimally disrupt the parent drug structure while still gaining the benefit of our targeted distribution. Our approach gives us freedom to operate with the novel derivatives we make as uh, has been amply demonstrated from other shared active cores uh, present in multiple drugs that uh, are uh, uh, independently uh, sold under different uh, brands with just small changes in the R groups. Uh, for example, here are three um, EGFR inhibitors, each sh sharing the same active core with small changes in the solvent exposed region of that molecule. So to enable us to accomplish this work, we had to invent a unique pH dependent cell growth inhibition assay that lets us see the difference in activity between tumor and healthy pH. Uh, and here we show osimertinib, uh, again, it's a weak base uh, EGFR inhibitor. That weak base we found contributes to about a six and a half fold detrimental bias. It's more toxic to cells treated at healthy pH than at tumor pH. If we replace this weakly basic amine group with one of our TAP groups, we flip this right around. We end up with a 17 fold beneficial bias, more toxic to cells treated at tumor pH than healthy pH. So we're both improving the potency at tumor pH and we're decreasing the toxicity at healthy pH. So combined, this is over 100-fold improvement on what's already a very successful drug. We've applied this across a range of different types of drugs. We have uh, kinase inhibitors, uh, hormone receptor modulators, DNA damage repair uh, inhibitors, and a number of different chemotherapies. 
meaning that we really have access to the whole landscape of oncology drugs. Each dot here is an individual approved drug plotted where Henderson Hasselbach would predict its biodistribution in the body based on PKA. As you can see, there are lots of weak bases, but only a couple weak acids. Um, then when we look at our TAP derivatives, we see they have significant improvements uh, that we can apply to this whole landscape. One TAP group in a drug gives us potentially 10 to 20 fold tumor specific distribution. If we can fit two in, which is just limited by Lipinski properties, uh, we can get potentially up to 300 fold improvement. So we've demonstrated with our first lead, which is kinase inhibitor for breast, a breast cancer target, uh, that we can make TAP derivatives that maintain or improve the target bi binding profile, uh, as our derivatives with TAP groups outside the binding pocket maintain the same kinase affinities as a parent, while our derivatives with TAP groups engineered into the pocket to make novel contacts with the, the protein can improve the target kinase specificity, uh, in this case, by about tenfold. And we've also demonstrated that derivatives impart tumor-targeted biodistribution, uh, as our derivatives produce uh, tremendous pH-dependent cell growth inhibition in vitro. Uh, and this translates to uh, tumor-specific biodistribution in vivo. Uh, we dose these in tumor-bearing mice uh, at one mg per kg IV to have just an even comparison. And our derivative achieved over 30-fold improvement in tumor accumulation versus the organ of this drug's dose-limiting toxicity, and over 90-fold improvement in tumor to blood exposure. Uh, this demonstrates that we can overcome some of the key toxicities in oncology, uh, allowing our drugs to be dosed significantly higher uh, to tumors uh, while still maintaining uh, tolerable levels in other tissues. And that allows us to produce stronger therapy. So in this study, digging a little deeper, we see clear evidence of both ion exclusion in the exclusion from the uh, organ of dose limiting toxicity and in ion trapping as our de derivative was maintained for longer and at higher concentration in the tumor than the parent drug in spite of having completely cleared from the blood. So we've clearly disentangled uh, the systemic from the tumor specific accumulation. So we can apply these same benefits to most oncology drugs, uh, including uh, these over 50 vetted targets in the cancer cell. Uh, so in order to focus our priorities, we've developed a really rigorous algorithm that allows us to prioritize targets uh, on the basis of um, technical feasibility, making sure we can tap it without changing its properties, market opportunity where we do a deep dive into uh, uh, the literature on the parent drug to demonstrate that if we could dose higher, we could get to greater outcomes uh, and making sure that the dist biodistribution benefits that we apply can overcome the key dose limiting toxicities that prevent the parent from reaching its goals. Uh, and then we differentiate these on the basis of executional risk where drugs that we can get approved on the basis of phase two uh, trials uh, and where there are clear paths to market we can do internally and where there are more complex clinical challenges, uh, we make sure we have partners in the pharma world uh, to develop those. And each case we always uh, have a clear freedom to operate. So this gives us access to uh, both first in class and best in class opportunities, um, giving us access to a, a huge range of, of new and existing uh, molecules out there. So we've identified from that extensive analysis of all 150 or so approved drugs uh, and uh, new and developing targets, our top priority, uh, priorities for development, both internally and for future internal work or BD co-development. Uh, and that covers a range of first in class and best in class targets, uh, each with opportunities for approval on the basis of phase two data and with clear paths to human proof of concept in phase one uh, with biomarker analyses and clear easy access to evaluating toxicities. Uh, the details of all of these we'd be happy to discuss under CDA. So by working with known drugs, we begin with what is a really highly de-risked compound uh, and a clear evidence-based path to market. So uh, we have a very low risk approach for development. And uh, we can also be highly efficient in optimizing TAP derivative leads. Um, we've set up a virtual model through this seed round uh, where we're working with, as I mentioned, a really world-class group of consultants and CROs uh, with decades of experience in doing this work uh, uh, to deliver on, on lead candidates. So we've set up a detailed timeline and budget laid out through phase two for each product. 
Uh, and for our current round, we can deliver three lead candidates in between uh, 13 to 15 months. The direct cost of that is about 4.2 million. We're setting aside 6 million to get us uh, plenty of runway to accommodate challenges and raise additional funds. And our model is to remain virtual through this seed round, maintaining the efficiency and flexibility that gives us, uh, then vertically integrate in a follow-on round as we set up for preclinical development. So Cytosolics represents a, a really rare opportunity to disrupt a large and established marketplace with a relatively low risk approach. Um, as I said, everything we're doing is technically straightforward. Um, since we're improving known drugs, we have an extensive knowledge base to evaluate our success or failure very early on in development. We don't spend a dollar on a product that doesn't completely obliterate the, the established com competition there. Uh, and if we're successful, we can envision the next generation of oncology drugs uh, will essentially all be TAP drugs. Because uh, after all, if you can get tumor specific activity in a toxic drug, uh, how could you not? So uh, we're looking for, for partners to help fill out this round uh, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot for the wonderful talk. Um, there any questions you can leave that in the chat box or um, raise your hand. Um, either way works. Yeah, we, we got a question is asking for, um, uh, so, so the question is um, all tumor uh, microenvironment has a lower pH or some of them um, are your drugs particularly focusing on those lower um, pH or um, as quite general treatment? Yeah, so it turns out that uh, basically every solid tumor has this heightened acidity. Um, it's a physiological feature of the solid tumor environment. So the tumor is eating up glucose, spitting out lactic acid uh, and CO2 constantly. And since you have this little ischemic environment of the solid tumor, every cell in there is just spitting out this acid and it accumulates. So for it to be a cancer, a solid cancer, it has to be acidic. So we see this occur very soon after the uh, oncogenic transformation, and it only escalates as uh, the cancers become more invasive. Uh, so in fact, more invasive metastatic disease is the most acidic, and so will be hit the hardest uh, by an acid-targeted drug. Then what if you turn it around, like uh, put that in a higher pH, so the tumor dies, or um, how, how that works, if you just um, increase the pH? For a solid tumor. So if if you increase the pH of a solid tumor and you're neutralizing the acidity, then you would make it more like healthy tissues. Um, what we actually like is the fact that by this lower pH, it's differentiated from healthy tissues. Uh, and so one of the tools we can actually use is to give a bolus of glucose before uh, treatment, and it transiently drops the pH even lower. So whereas a, a traditional solid tumor is about pH 6.2, if you give a bolus of glucose, you can get it down below six into about 5.9. Um, and this hugely differentiates it from health, healthy tissues. And our TAP drugs, can be really specifically accumulating in those tumors while staying out of all the healthy tissues where they cause toxicity. But if you were to increase uh, the the, uh, the pH, and you know by giving sodium bicarbonate, for example, and it was a weak base drug that you were giving them as a chemotherapeutic, then you would be increasing toxicity to healthy tissue. Gotcha, gotcha. So that cannot be a treatment, right? <laughs> that cannot be a treatment. Okay. No. Bicarbonate has never helped, it turns out. <laughs> okay. Are there <clears throat> any other questions? Um, we got a question asking, are there any other healthy tissue environment that is a stick, which might cause off-target effect? Sure. So it turns out that all of the other compartments that produce acidic environments in the body are luminal or outside the body in some sense. So the stomach, for example, it pumps acid to help digest food, but that's not exposed to circulation. So uh, the other environments, um, uh, the kidneys dispose of acids. So the urine becomes somewhat acidic and the outside of the skin is somewhat acidic to prevent infection. 
all of these are outside of blood flow exposure. So circulating drugs will go to uh, only one acidic tissue in the body and that's a solid tumor. Uh, if you apply something topically, now that's a different story, but in, in our case, we're looking for oral drugs. Cool. Um, and also there's a question is asking for um, acidic, like um, for, for, for the tissue as general, like acidic or is it in the membrane or is this uh, cytoplasm? for the oncology from the cancer cells? Yeah, so the distribution of acidity. The cell is producing acidic metabolites from eating glucose and, and creating lactic acid. And it's upregulated the machinery that checks that outside of the cell. So the environment right outside of the cell membrane gets the most acidic and it creates a gradient outside of the cell um, towards sort of the bulk circulating fluid. And while you have cells side by side, you, you accumulate the acidity in between those cells in that extracellular space. So that's what we're calling the uh, extracellular acidic microenvironment. Okay. Um, I have a question for myself and also, um, so for the TPA, uh, the tap screening system or as for current FDA approved drugs, if I'm understanding correctly. So the question is how to avoid the um, legal dispute uh, with other companies and how to protect the IPs of your own product? Yeah, so uh, our IP situation is this. When I first discovered this, I, I thought for sure somebody had been working on this because it seemed so obvious, so powerful. Um, and when I looked, no one had designed acids that had a PKA in the right range to discriminate between tumors and healthy tissues. So what we had to do is spend two years and a really extensive grant with a set of medicinal chemists to design novel acids that could achieve it. So our platform is that huge load of work where we established the library of all possible reasonable uh, weekly acidic groups that could do this job. And that forms the, the foundation of our IP. So the compositions of those acids are ours. Um, it would be very hard for somebody to find something that didn't fit under our, our hood there. Uh, now, when we incorporate those into a drug, I just said those are novel, non-obvious acids. They weren't envisioned by the parent uh, uh, innovators as well. So their IP involves only our groups that are unlike our TAP groups. So whenever we incorporate a TAP group into a drug, we have an NCE that was not envisioned and we have freedom to operate. Thanks. Um, due to the time, uh, we probably call it. So if you have any more, any more questions, feel free to uh, put that in the chat box or ask us by emails. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, Colin. It's really wonderful um, talk and a wonderful slice. I mean, it's, it's really beautiful slice. I, I, I'm afraid you guys put a lot of effort on the slice. It's really beautiful. <laughs> Appreciate it. Have a good one. Yeah. Thank uh, and thanks a lot and have a good night. Thank you. Good thanks. Night. Yeah. Okay. The next uh, company is going to be uh, Neuro um, Chronics. Neuro Chronics is developing a novel. Uh, non opioid uh, therapeutics for the management of uh, 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 chronic pain. It is, I, I believe, is a Lexington based company and is supported by um, a VA and NIH right now. So um, the team is going to talk about it. I, I believe the Sume La, um, the founder and CEO. Sume, if um, yeah, you can share, start to share a screen. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I should uh, start by introducing the, the team myself and, and uh, my colleague Ada is here with me. Actually, Ada is just uh, taking over as the, as the CEO of the company, but uh, today today I will, I will just go ahead and make the presentation. Uh, so yeah, so company is called Neurochronics. We are developing non-opioid therapies for treating uh, chronic neuropathic pain. We have uh, indicative data that our uh, drug candidates can also prevent chronic pain-induced anxiety and depression. And as Michael mentioned, uh, we are uh, based in Lexington, Massachusetts. So uh, maybe Ada, I think it might be good good time to just uh, introduce yourself and share your background. That would be that'll be helpful. 
Yes, of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Ada Silo Santiago, and I'm the CEO at Neurochronics. I uh, am an MD, PhD by training, and I have extensive experience in the biotech company from startups to uh, mid sized companies, where I have worked in pain programs uh, for the majority of my career, um, including uh, visceral pain in dealing. When I was in Ironwood Pharmaceuticals, we have a drug that went all the way to FDA approval for IBS constipation. And my group discovered the mechanism of improvement of visceral pain and discovered a new pathway. Uh, this is a drug that has last year, it has a sale uh, more than $1 billion. Um, I have an extensive um, experience in the drug discovery from very early assets all the way to clinical development. It is a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you, Ada. Uh, I wanted to also share the backgrounds of our uh, co-founders, uh, Dr. Karen Westland High is a professor and vice chair of research at the uh, University of uh, New Mexico and has extensive experience in chronic pain research uh, is a very well respected uh, scientist in, in the field of, of uh, pain and uh, is actually an inventor on patents describing some of the existing pain medications. Uh, Dr. Bill Chin is our uh, co founder. He uh, is also a physician by background and uh, was former faculty and Howard Hughes investigator at, uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, at Harvard. and. Uh, was also at Eli Lilly for 12 years where he led the global research, uh, late discovery and early development of uh, more than a hundred uh, drug candidates. So extensive experience in, in, uh, in the industry where he also actually worked in the field of uh, developing drugs for chronic pain. About myself, I am uh, uh, also a physician scientist by training. Uh, after going to business school, I've been uh, working in the field of startups and technology commercialization for the last 10 years. Uh, and off late, uh, all my interest has been in early stage uh, drug development. Uh, our colleagues Adi uh, at Mayo Clinic has played a big a key role in the development of the drug candidates, which we will talk about later. Uh, Philip Tan uh, comes with extensive industry experience in the field of uh, short chain fragment within antibodies, which is uh, the modality that we are using in, in, our, uh, in our company. So that is the team. Uh, we are very happy and excited about uh, the team that we have uh, come together to build the company. Uh, and let's uh, talk a little bit about chronic pain. As uh, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, uh, in the US, definitely, it is a, uh, and worldwide, actually, uh, it is a large addressable market uh, need and hence also opportunity. Uh, close to this is all the numbers are US centric. Uh, almost 20% of US adults have chronic pain. Almost 3 million cases are diagnosed each year. Uh, the healthcare cost related to chronic pain management is actually bigger than that uh, when uh, you look at uh, heart disease or cancer and diabetes uh, like this. Is Hi, Suman. It's, it's, yeah. it's a little bit breaking out. Probably your hands is blocking the mic, I guess. Oh, I see. Sorry. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, and, and pain is also a leading cause of disability uh, because of all the associated uh, depression, sleep disorders, and, uh, and also addiction that happens with, with pain treatment. And very few, talking about pain treatment, there are very few treatment options uh, for chronic pain right now. In terms of pharmacological treatments in neuropathic pain, uh, patients very quickly move into treatment with antidepressants and anti-seizure medications like gabapentin and then to opioids. And as I'm sure uh, all of you are well aware, uh, we are in the midst of an opioid crisis uh, in, in this country and uh, close to 25% of patients with chronic pain misuse opioids and uh, a big percentage of them develop addiction and 100,000 people die from overdoses. Even the second line treatment uh, like gabapentin is also addictive. So there is a huge need 
in all sectors, whether it's industry, whether it's the NIH, the FDA, uh, from the public that uh, a non-opioid therapy is developed. So there's a lot of interest and support in, in, in development of uh, such candidates. So what we have is uh, Neurochronics has developed uh, two assets, uh, which are uh, short chain fragment variant antibodies against uh, two well-known receptors and targets in chronic pain, of which we will talk about the first one today uh, in, in this presentation, which is the cholecystokinin B receptor, CCKB, uh, which is also known as the CCK2 uh, receptor. It is a well-known receptor, well-known target for chronic pain. And uh, what is understood pain is fairly complex uh, pathophysiology. Uh, what is known is that if you activate CCKB receptor, uh, both centrally and in the peripheral nervous system, it leads to hyperalgesia. In, uh, in other words, it leads to pain. And uh, uh, use of CCK antagonist, CCK receptor antagonist reduces pain. And these are the regions in the central and peripheral nervous system, which uh, where CCK receptors are usually expressed at a high level, although it is present in, in other tissues as well. So despite all of this, the development of drugs against CCKB receptors have not really progressed because it has been very challenging uh, to develop drugs against uh, this particular target because there's a CCKA receptor, which is its uh, sister. And uh, which is present in different other tissues like the gut and obvious uh, and uh, often leads to adverse effects. So it has been challenging to specifically target CCKP. Uh, more importantly, uh, it was also difficult to target CCKB receptors in the brain uh, with uh, even small molecules are, are big uh, in that context to penetrate the blood brain barrier or in, in other tissues where there is uh, uh, this it's hard to do uh, achieve tissue, enough tissue penetration and have enough affinity uh, to block this receptor. So that has been uh, traditionally the challenge to uh, to develop drugs against this target. What we have done and is has developed in the company is that uh, we have developed SCFPs, which are short chain fragment variant antibodies. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with monoclonal antibodies. Uh, which looks like how uh, you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the Y-shaped molecule, uh, it's about 160 to 200 kilodaltons. Uh, there are many monoclonal antibodies, which are uh, multi-billion dollar drugs. What we have used is a, a technique called ribosome display uh, to actually screen uh, for short chain fragment variants, that circle, what is uh, in, the, in the circle, uh, to develop this small, variants, which are actually 25 kilodaltons in, uh, in size, which, which actually can lead to very specific binding against targets and achieve very high affinity and also achieve high tissue penetration. Uh, for example, it can cross the blood brain barrier and actually uh, uh, large at these targets. So, and we are not the first ones to use SCFPs uh, as an approach, as a therapeutic approach. There are other companies and drugs in the market uh, that has been approved uh, for other, in other therapeutic areas. So what we did was uh, we, we tested the SCFEs against CCKB receptors in uh, different models of chronic uh, neuropathic pain, uh, which we have extensive experience in. Our team has uh, decades of experience in multiple uh, pain models uh, caused by nerve injury, caused by chemotherapy, uh, caused uh, due to other inflammatory, uh, inflammatory uh, causes. So we actually uh, look at not just pain relief, but also in these models, look at uh, uh, relief in anxiety and, and depression as well, uh, using uh, multiple methods. And what we show here is a representative data uh, from uh, the SCFE against uh, uh, CCKB receptor. So this is a this is a uh, slightly dense graph, but I'll try to explain. What you see on the left uh, on the y-axis is the mechanical threshold uh, that is required to elicit uh, pain. 
And if you notice the blue line, uh, that actually signals that there is no pain even at high, uh, high pressures, high, high, high mechanical thresholds. Whereas in, in animal models, which have uh, been developed for, uh, for pain, where either it could be a crush injury or a ligation of a nerve, you can see that in about uh, two weeks, the animals uh, start having a very high degree of pain. And that is the, uh, the red line that you can, can look at. Now, when you inject the drug uh, at day 20, uh, the, the yellow line that you see there is the standard of care drug. Uh, in our case, this is carbamazepine. Uh, why you see all of that are grouped together is because the effect of these drugs last only for four, four to six hours and you have to inject them again. But if you look at the black uh, line in the graph, that is the result of uh, the SCFVs. And as you can see, we are able to achieve the same level of pain reduction in these models uh, that is achieved by the standard of care. But with just a single dose, we are able to achieve pain relief for close to 60 days. Uh, this is pretty dramatic uh, from what we have seen uh, in our careers. When I say uh, our careers, it's not me, but the rest of the team who has extensive experience in, in pain research and drug development. Uh, this is quite, quite dramatic that we are able to see these results. With just one single injection, uh, you are able to uh, achieve pain relief for two months. So that is really a representative data that we wanted to share with you uh, today about the efficacy of the, of the drug candidate. We also have some data which shows that uh, the anxiety and uh, tests for depression also show significant improvements in these, uh, in these mice models uh, with the, uh, when treated with these SCFVs, and they are also dose dependent. So it is obviously, I need to emphasize that these are pain associated anxiety and depression. We have had uh, quite some support uh, and validation from various agencies like uh, the US Department of Defense, uh, the NIH, uh, and the Department of Veterans Affairs in advancing this program and uh, in, in, for, in the form of funding uh, to the research groups, but also uh, assembling a group of experts uh, to, to help us advance this program. So uh, there is a big joint effort uh, in, in making uh, this uh, uh, commercial. In terms of the intellectual property, we have both composition of matter and method of use patents uh, on these SCFVs, which are worldwide and uh, have extensive, uh, fairly close to 15 years of patent life. And the company has uh, an exclusive license uh, to these patents for worldwide commercialization. I should mention that the technology was developed jointly between four institutions, which is the University of New Mexico, Mayo Clinic, uh, the Loyola University in Chicago, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. So that is uh, where the IP originates and the company has obtained an exclusive license for commercialization. And we have, uh, we are at a stage where we have not really decided on the exact uh, clinical indication that we would be pursuing. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, speaking with uh, a variety of KOLs, uh, both clinicians and drug development experts and, uh, and deciding on, uh, which clinical indication to pursue. It obviously is going to be guided by a combination of uh, experimental results in terms of biology and mechanisms, uh, but also uh, the commercial aspects, as well as the regulatory pathway, not to mention uh, the clinical trial feasibility. Uh, we want to look at uh, you know, trial, uh, trial size, costs, and uh, you know, recruitment rate, et cetera. So in this case, uh, but we, we feel confident that just because of the the market size, uh, it, these, all of these are big opportunities. When diabetic peripheral neuropathy alone uh, represents a, a, a more than a billion dollars in, in, in sales uh, for 10% of the volume share of the market. So we know that if we get to proof of concept phase two, uh, we 
we are on to a very uh, high uh, valuation trajectory. Uh, but the company, uh, if we could develop a commercial drug, uh, this is this is in the blockbuster sales category that, that we can get to. And uh, that is actually evidenced by some of the transactions in the field of uh, chronic pain. Uh, several companies have been acquired or assets have been licensed, uh, typical in, in biotech fashion with upfront payments uh, and uh, milestone payments that go sometimes even close to a billion dollars. And these are all based on very early stage studies. So what, uh, what we are uh, at a stage where we are raising our very first round. Uh, so this is, we are raising a million dollars at a post money valuation of 10 million to conduct some key experiments over the next eight to 12 months, uh, which uh, are mentioned on the slide. This including uh, synthesis and manufacturing assessment of these CFPs in an external setting, some key PK studies. We have not done official PK studies. Uh, selectivity studies and uh, dose ranging studies. We have done of so done uh, part of these experiments in the university setting, but we need to be able to do this in an external setting. So we are raising a uh, million dollars, and uh, we are on track uh, to to close this round. And uh, yeah, we would uh, welcome participation uh, from. Any, any, anyone potentially interested and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Suman, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. The first question is from uh, Jing, Jing Chiang, asking, is a um, SCFV required to cross the BBB for efficacy? Any uh, mechanism to enhance the BBB um, penetration? Yeah, so uh, there is, uh, we have data which shows that even after just one single dose, we are able to uh, see histag residues in different parts of the brain of uh, the SCFV uh, after many, after multiple weeks uh, of uh, sacrificing the mice, uh, showing that the actually the, these SCFVs are able to, to actually penetrate the blood brain barrier. And not just that, we have done uh, affinity studies, which shows a very high degree of affinity and specificity of these SCFVs to the target. A lot of these are due to two main reasons are, uh, one, it's a uh, small size, and second, it's very high degree of specificity, which is otherwise difficult to achieve with small molecules. And to answer the second question, whether that is needed, uh, BBB penetration for efficacy, certainly for the CNS symptoms associated with pain, like anxiety and depression. Uh, yes, it is. As Suman said, we see uh, penetration uh, and residence in the brain tissues. But also for the pain effect, there is a peripheral component. And we have seen the effects of these small molecules blocking the hypersensitivity of uh, sensory neurons in the periphery. So it is both. And there is one other question on the CMC. Ada, maybe you can uh, yeah. you can talk about CMC, our work that is being carried out on that. Yes, at this moment, we are doing the feasibility studies to see whether there are any issues with manufacturability. Um, we don't have a specific data yet. Uh, based on the sequence analysis, we don't expect any, but we are in the process to doing all the experiments. Uh, for us, that is very important because uh, we want to know sooner rather than later what may be the issue with manufacturing. So a very good question. We have uh, Philip Tan who has extensive experience and we are quite fortunate to have him in our team. Uh, extensive experience with SCFPs as therapeutic agents in the clinic. And uh, he, he'll be coming in actually, uh, as full time to lead our CMC efforts uh, post, post Series A. Uh, there was actually a que that question also talked about uh, PK. Uh, we yeah. do not have. Uh, 
our understanding is that the half life of SCFEs are very short. Uh, despite that, we are able to see long term pharmacodynamic effects. Uh, with, with this. What is half life right now? It's between 30 to 60 minutes, or uh, max is an hour and a half, right, Ada? Well, no, we, we don't have data with PK. In fact, we are raising this money to do these experiments, but based on other uh, uh, SCFBs out there, it could be from 30 minutes up to six hours. Uh, for systemic exposure. Well, that's a huge range from 30 minutes to six hours. It, uh, it, it is a huge range. For that reason, these experiments are important uh, to be done. But what we do know, as Suman said, is that uh, 10 weeks after a single administration, we are able to detect the histac with which we have labeled these SVFCs uh, in regions of the brain that they are involved in pain modulation and depression. Yeah, I agree with um, the question that probably some PKPZ study is also important. Yes, they are. We yeah. agree. Mm -hmm. And also there is a question that's asking for uh, what is any advantage for as, uh, for this uh, CFB against the CCKBR peptide? Um, well, as as yeah, that's, that's along the lines that we discussed earlier where uh, we are able to achieve that specific and uh, affinity, which we are not able to, to achieve with the small molecules. We can do that with SCFBs. Yeah, um, actually, I also wanted to follow up on that question. So because your uh, product NC772 and NC773, um, you, you said the target is CCKBR and the P2X4R, if I, rem I remember correctly. That's so right. there any um, data showing that this is a target, there any about chemistry or any some other evidence showing okay this is a real target for the MOA. I think it's also um, cap, um, part of the question from the first one as well. Yeah, uh, so CCKB has been studied. Both CCKB and P2X4R has been studied as uh, as pain targets uh, for quite some time, and uh, it's fairly well known in in terms of its uh, role in in pain. But uh, there has been no progress uh, in the clinical, uh, at the preclinical uh, stage, yes, but in the clinical stage, uh, has not been able to develop successfully uh, drugs uh, that target these receptors. Yeah, so the target convolution or uh, CRISPR probably can help uh, with this question in the future. Or, or, or a mass yeah. try, to, try to IP that, um, detect with mass back, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's that's actually a good good point. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there any other questions? Um, there is a question is asking how to um, measure the animal pain, like the scales in your. Uh, I, I think it's in your behavior test, right? I don't know, maybe you can. Yeah, so there are different ways that we can look at the pain in animals. Uh, usually it's a reflexive behavior. And as you can see, uh, what you do it is touch uh, the area of the animal that you have induced the pain. Could be the paw if it is peripheral nerve injury, or could be the face if it is a trigeminal neuralgia model, that the one that we have shown here and you apply pressure uh, into the area of the animal and the animal will withdraw the paw of the face in response of that pressure. And the more pain the animal have, the less pressure you are applying. So in the graph that uh, Suman showed, you see that a pressure of 10 grams is what it will take for a normal animal with no pain to withdraw the paw or the face but if those animals are in pain it, with less than 0.1 grams of pressure, uh, the animal will withdraw. So that it is uh, how you measure pain in animals. Also, you can do the same with thermal stimuli, uh, both hot stimuli or cold stimuli. And you look at, again at the withdrawal of the pore or the face uh, towards the stimulus that you are applying. Similar that you can do in humans if you apply 
a pinprick into the into the hand of somebody. Uh, the more pain you have, the less pressure you need to apply. Thanks a lot, Ada, for the uh, explanation. Okay, due to time, if you have more questions, feel free to ask us uh, through emails or uh, later connect with us or um, BCIC. I um, mean, either is fine. Yeah, uh, also the, the contacts on the, right on the screen. Um, any investors, feel free to contact them directly. Um, so it's really a wonderful talk and uh, for um, chemotherapy introduced pain. I think it's quite a coincidence with the first company, Osmo, but it's on a totally different field, totally different directions. Um, a really nice talk. Um, so yeah, have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, the next company is going to be um, uh, Ebulus. Ebulus was established, it was established in 2018, uh, dedicated to the development of tissue cell target protein degradation drug, like Protac or uh, molecular glue. The core members of uh, Ebulus uh, bio r and team has more than 20 years of successful drug development experience in multinational pharmaceutical companies. Um, uh, today, the, the, uh, the one of the team members, Feng, is going to um, talk about it. Uh, Feng Ding, you here? You can unmute yourself. Oh, phone is not joining us. Hmm. So phone is in the in the uh, panelist right now. Uh, is the AI phone uh, AI? No, are you, are you? Are you here? No. Okay, then due to the time, we should probably move to the uh, next company. Uh, just give me a sec when I confirm that. Yeah. Somehow, um, I think there might be some technical difficulties. So due to time, we should probably move to the next company if they're here. Let me see. Uh, Jen, you, you, you're here, Jen? Are you in the audience? Okay, Jen is here. All right, so due to the time, we should probably move to the next company. Um, the next company is uh, uh, Geothera uh, Geode Therapeutics. Uh, Geode Therapeutics is focusing on uh, P10, which is a major uh, tumor processor and the key ne uh, negative regulator of PI3K activity. Uh, P10 uh, deficient cancer uh, uh, represented rough, uh, 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 roughly 120K new cases yearly in the United States with many more patients worldwide. Um, today, uh, one of the founders, uh, Jing uh, Zhao is going to talk about it. Jing, I, I just saw you join in. Uh, welcome to- um, Yes, Michael. Unmute yourself and share the screen. Excellent, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, yeah. let me uh, share screen. I just joined, so that's really on time, huh? Excellent. <laughs> wow. You can go full screen, yeah. Perfect. Okay, excellent. 
you can see, right? Yep. Can you hear me well? Yeah, it's perfect. Great. So everybody, um, nice evening or nice morning, you know, good morning or good evening. Um, this Geode uh, Therapeutics, our logo, it's uh, Geode. It's a sort of metaphor, metaphor of this stone. And they, <clears throat> the real target is really inside, so you have to go deeper. So our company theme is to develop a sort of novel and rational um, integration of target therapy and immunotherapy to break through cancer. Um, so uh, myself and, and Dr. Tom Roberts, uh, co-founders, and then the company is incorporated in Delaware in November 2018. Uh, we don't have a CEO yet, so to be determined. So what is the problem? What's the challenge in the field? Um, so this, there's a dysregulation of the P10, PR3K pathway in disease and disorders, mainly in cancer. And of course, there's other like P10 hematoma tumor syndrome. This is um, a, a, a sort of array of diseases and associated with um, genetic, you know, inherited and family, familial and all these in kids. And there's no therapy for this. And there's also metabolic disorders like obesity. It's actually associated with P10 deficiency or P10 deficiency is one of the cause of obesity. And in new dysfunction autoimmune disease, you have you know, some of the kids with the P10 mutation, they have autism and, and, and autoimmune disease and, 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 and other um, conditions. So to date, there, um, there's no single um, approved therapy specifically designed to treat P10 deficient disease or disorder. So which represents uh, one of the greatest unmet needs. So what is the solution? Okay, sorry. So I, I would like to co-focus on the, the expand on a little bit, little bit more on this problem. So in the cancer, so let's say we focus on cancer as a first um, you know, the disease to target. And the cancer, if you look at the mutational uh, landscape, which is genetic and then gene level, mutational landscape of cancer genes and the P10, P3, candidate pathway. So this is sort of, you know, the uh, one of the papers published, of, although it's old, but still uh, represents the, the spectrum of these um, cancer genes. And then you can see the top three most mutated cancer genes, one, the P53, which is a tumor suppressor. The second is PIK3CA, which the gene encodes P3 kinase alpha, ISO4. Uh, the third one is P10. So I had the P10, very interesting. P10 is gene is the third, is a tumor suppressor again. So I want to sort of a little bit more on P10. So P10 is a tumor suppressor. It's very, very important to protect your health and your um, overall uh, you know, pathological or, or normal physiological functions. If you have P10 function uh, you know, deficiency that, that will have different kinds of um, pathological conditions and the extreme case is cancer. So even though if you have wild type of P10 genes and then you will have transcriptional, so that's the genetic level, you have um, transcriptional expression reduced and you have post-transcriptional, post-translational um, reduced gene expression of P10 and also the, um, the mislocalization. So the, the various ways to lose P10 function. And uh, so P10 dosage, this, this is the paper says P10, P10 dosage is very, very important. Even you lo lost one copy of P10, you still have one copy, you still have protected, but is haplo insufficiency. And even you have one copy of P10 gene, but you still will have loss of P10 at expression level, at a protein level and then mislocalization. So that, and then to summarize that, loss of function of P10 
all patented deficiency through genetic mutations, epigenetic silencing, or post-transcriptional translational inactivation is the most common mechanism leading to hyperactivation of the PI3 kinase pathway. Very interesting. So I will say that which contributes to tumor initiation, tumor progression, metastasis, and therapeutic resistance, which across nearly all types of cancer. So it's, it's I'm not sort of like overstated. This is actually perhaps understated. It's very, very important to P10 function. Um, so why I say P10 loss is the, um, the most uh, sort of the mechanism, most important mechanism leading to PI3 kinase pathway um, activation. So this is the very simplified diagram show the PI3 kinase signaling pathway downstream of receptor targeting kinases and the GPCRs. And then you, know, you all know PI3 K, KTM top pathway leading to all the cellular processes if dysregulated and you get a cancer. And P10 is very, very important protein control the PI3 kinase pathway. If you lose P10, then you get all kinds of disease and cancer. The PI3 kinase now, I fo I'm focusing on class 1 PI3K, PI3 kinases. In the class 1 PI3K, you perhaps heard about PI3 kinase alpha, PI3 kinase beta, delta, and gamma. And the gene name is PIK3CA. So sometimes you will see that papers say P110 alpha, P110 beta, delta, gamma. So this is the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase alpha. So, but to be so that I try to just put them together so you know how what we are saying, we are talking about the PIK3CA gene, which here encodes the P110 alpha subunit of PI3 kinase alpha. So we can call just PI3 kinase alpha to be simple. Um, beta is PIK3CB, and then the four distinct uh, genes encoding for this. And I also want to um, pay attention that alpha beta expressed in all tissues, you know, solid tissues, liquid tissues, you, this all everywhere, all tissues and organs. Delta and gamma only expressed in hematopoietic cells, liquid, uh, your lymphocyte. Okay. So <clears throat> among all these PI3 kinase uh, family members, PI3 kinase alpha, there's one help listed by Novartis approved um, a couple of years ago to target, uh, it's approved for breast cancer, you know, actually usually luminal breast cancer with PIK3CA mutation, because in luminal breast cancer, up to 50% of breast cancer have the PIK3CA mutation. So this is approved to be combined with, you know, um, for Vestron and uh, um, that, that's the uh, endocrine therapy. Um, there's a data called idolisib approved for B cell lymphoma. And the dual lecib, which is a dual PI3 kinase data and the gamma inhibitor. So this was approved for lymphocytic leukemia too, because these are only expressed in hematopoietic cells. Okay, so the, only the beta is quite here. Nothing approved for beta. So the 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 question, I think the it's not million, it's billion dollar question for this is which isoform of PI3 kinase to target in P10 deficient disease or P10 deficient cancer. Um, our solution is targeting PI3 kinase beta, which PI3 kinase beta is not really um, many people paying attention. It's sort of behind the scene. And um, actually, so we think the PI3 kinase family is very important. Uh, in cancer, we should target PI3 kinase family the each isoform or each member individually uh, based on the context. And for this, our team, uh, we actually, it's more than 10 years ago, we said, that, you know, the PI3 kinase isoforms should be targeted individually, selectively. And we 
published the two papers, you know, um, consecutively in 2009, this nature review drug discovery. And then more recently, we have another review paper on them. You know, that each individual isoforms where the mode of activation with therapeutic targeting. So with that, I give you a little bit of sort of uh, historical, you know, a, a brief history. <laughs> so the PIP kinase actually was discovered in mid 80s by Lou Cantley and Tom Roberts. So Tom Roberts is the one of the co-founder. Lou Cantley is our seven member. So they discovered the PIP-K in mid 80s. And uh, uh, Michael Waterfield in UK cloned the P first the PIS bovine PIP kinase alpha, which is alpha. And uh, so after that, um, uh, Peter Vogt in late 70s found the PIP kinase alpha actually can transform. This is the uh, Cho cells, which the avian retrovirus can transform that Cho cells with avian virus. And I joined Tom Roth's lab in 1999, and then we published that actually PIP kinase alpha can transform human cells. That was the first described human memory epithelial cells, actually. And uh, after this 203, after, right after that, the 204, Hopkins group find that pic 3 ca is frequently mutated in human cancer. Very interesting, very high in breast cancer. So quickly, uh, Novartis started their first called pan PIVK, PIVK mTOR inhibitor BZ235 uh, in a clinical trial, but quickly withdraw the from clinical because of the poor PK. And then later they started the BEZ, uh, BZ214, which is the view policy. Um, then in 2008, uh, our team found actually P10 loss depend on PI3 kinase beta, which is really surprising finding. We published in Nature, I'll tell you the story. And after that, based on this, based on the clinical data, based on our preclinical data study, and Tom and I, we proposed targeting PI3 kinase isoform in cancer. That's what we published that two sort of perspective review um, in 2009. <clears throat> so I, tell you this, what we found in 2008, uh, that nature paper. So we want to study the PI3 has alpha beta in prostate cancer. Of course, in solid tumor, you only need to look on the alpha and beta because there's no data and gamma. And in prostate cancer, P10 loss, the genetic loss, the gene mutation or deletion, it, you identify in about 20% of primary prostate tumors and in castration resistant tumors or advanced prostate cancer, uh, it, they say it's about 50%. This is gene genetic level. If you look for uh, transcriptional, um, you know, ex loss of, you know, expression epigenetic level or protein loss of this, I would say more than 90% and even 100%, I can exaggerate. But it's P10 is very, very important in prostate cancer. And then you lost P10, and then it's really dose dependent. You lost more loss P10, more, and then more aggressive. Um, that renders um, resistant to all kinds of therapeutic uh, intervention. So that time, that was like a 2005, six. You know, we start to do the genetically engineered mouse model. And the way what it did was we, uh, this is the mouse prostate, normal wild type. And if you delete the P10, now you start to see this. So it's like the overgrowth of this, you know, we specifically delete the P10 in the prostate tissue. And then you get tumor. Um, and then if you delete alpha together, you delete P10 and P10 alpha, you still get tumor. Tumor may be slightly more advanced was very, very surprising. And then delete the P1 and beta, you don't get tumor. So we, that was totally, um, I would say it is not expected, the opposite. The way everybody expected in the field, expect P1 and alpha deletion, uh, you know, with the block P10 loss induced the prostate cancer, but it's not, it's beta. 
So we, we thought, oh, genotyping is wrong. This is wrong. We kept checking this is a real observation. So we published in Nature at that time, and we really had a very superficial mechanism. Okay, so that was the finding. And then after that, there are array of you know, papers, you know, into a quickly Novartis, a group of scientists find they, they use the SI RNA, the BTPI mechanism alpha and the beta, they found the beta is important for P10 loss, you know, cancer. And it's our paper. And then this is Neil Rosen's paper from um, Sloan Kettering. And, and this is from Jose. They think P10 loss leads to clinical resistance to PI2 cancer alpha inhibition. So that's uh, a nature paper. And then later this um, Patrick Woosley, you know, they found that the loss of P10 promotes resistance to P cell mediated immunotherapy. Um, PD1, PDL1, whatever. Okay, so that's uh, just a few examples here. And then in our group in the laboratory, we said, well, <clears throat> that was a broad prostate cancer. What about the breast cancer? So we uh, so we so we we got you know this is this a breast case, um, breast cancer, and then this is sort of normal, and uh, this is sort of BCIS. Um, it, it's not at the, you know, it's not advanced and then, and then I'm oh, sorry. So uh, in breast cancer, P10 loss is, you can approximately 30 to 40%. Uh, and then if you look for reduced expression up to 60 and 70%, if you look at protein even higher. So it's a very common breast cancer as well. So again, we do genetically engineered mouse model. And again, the P10 loss, you see this is normal is like, like a here, normal lobule, you know, the ductal is empty, halo. And the P10 loss, you see like this, you know, overgrowth of tumor cells in within the duct. And then P10 and the alpha deletion, you, you still see this. And the beta deletion, so this is consistent with the prostate model, but we're not really satisfied with this because this is not really, it's, it's early stage of cancer, uh, in real situation, we want to treat is advanced cancer, is a metastatic cancer, um, poorly differentiated cancer. So if you look at the um, basal like breast cancer, if you look, P, you know, like usually P10, I say genetic loss is like 30, 40%, but if you're looking for expression level loss, protein loss, even 60, 70, they usually always co-occur with P53 mutations or P53 deletions here. So this is breast cancer. And then this took us as that. So we made a syngenic gem model. That's a long story. So we just, this is um, many, many years of genetic. We backcross everything with same, same background and intercross them. So this is K14 Cree. So to delete um, P10 or PIP53 or PIP3 times alpha in the basal compartment of memory gland to so basically generate uh, triple negative breast cancer. That's what it is. Okay, just a um, long story short. And then we made the tumor model. And uh, so the PP is the P10, P53 loss. And the tumor model, so that's what I said is the syngenic. So the tumor can be engrafted into the neutomize, which is immunodeficient. FEB is the syngenic um, tumor allograft. It's immunocompetent. So they have all the innate immune system and adaptive immune system. And the PP tumor in neutomize uh, grow faster. This is a tumor volume than in FB. So you see there's some delay because of immune, immune system try to prevent to form the tumor, basically. Okay, so this is the PPA. If you have P10, P53 co-loss, and then you delete PI3 kinds of alpha, Tumor grow faster. That was surprising. Tumor, so you would think, oh, the, you know, P10 suppress, uh, control the PI3K pathway. The PI3 kinds of alpha deletion would block some, right? No, tumor grow faster. So that's another surprising, uh, you know, you see that time, you know, the, um, the, the here in the PPA, if you're talking, so if you delete PI3 kinds of alpha, the neutomizing FEB, so there's no um, immune 
blockage. Basically, they grow tumor at the same latency and uh, media like 15, you know, like less than 15 days. Surprising. More surprisingly, I show you that <coughs> PPB. So P10, P53 tumor. And then if you delete P110 beta or P3CB, and in new mice, they, they still grow tumor, but they're much delayed, even delayed than PP tumors. Uh, here say 35 days, here say would it be like 60 days. In FBB, they didn't get tumor. So my this is, you know, like a, the old post already left because so many years of work and a new post are joined the lab. And then Yuhan, then he said, during like 300 days, I don't get a tumor. I wish I have, like, I, I want to have, I'm still waiting. I want to have some small tumor I can study it, but there's no tumor. You know, you can look at the, the tumor bed, there's no single tumor cells. Because <laughs> that time we don't, when a few years ago, it's like, wow, this is so surprising. So this is why, because we thought that, you know, when tumor more aggressive and then maybe they will de depend, less depend on PIC and beta. But no, they they depend on PIC and beta still. Okay. So then <clears throat> the Yuhan, the postdoc, they did another thing. So like, what happened if I transplant that's PP or PPA or not PPB tumor cells in the memory gland. So the author topic. And the five days after, so he just, you know, isolated the memory gland, the entire thing. And uh, this is the cross. So this is a cross section. This is longitudinal maybe. And then this, you see the, the you know, the, so elongated. And then he did IHC, CISIF, and the profile, immune profile, whatever. So this is a PP tumor. The red is the um, uh, phosphate AKT cell, which is the PT loss tumor cells there. CD45 in the immune cells. Immune cells are outside. And then if you enlarge it, and then some infiltration of CDA, CD4, CD8 T cells here. And the PPA, the tumor is cross-section. And it's very, it's tumor cells. All the immune cells, is excluded from the tumor region that you can solve his immune cell desert, you know? So tumor cells is like, um, they reject all the immune cells to get into the tumor zone and then tumor can grow. If you look at PPB cells, you can start to see, and I want to say that red, red here is tumor cells and all this yellow, it's all immune cells, CD48. So meaning that after five days, the tumor cells, the residual tumor cells here, and all massive immune cells infiltrated or intruded into the tumor bed, which we inject millions of tumor cells, they got all killed. And then you see massive CDA, CD4 T cells. It's really, really interesting. Okay, so just long story short. So what about the, so that was a genetic finding. What about the pharmacological inhibitors? So we have this PP, you know, the P10 loss and P3 loss tumors. Grow. And then we use PI3 kinds of alpha selective inhibitor, PI3 and beta selective inhibitor, PD1. <clears throat> and it seems like not much. But if you look at the PI3 kinds of beta plus PD1 blockade and 100% tumor control and 50% of them develop uh, uh, tumor regression. And then with these regressive tumors, if you do tumor re-challenge, they reject all these tumor cells, PP tumor cells. So <clears throat> once the tumor is, so the genetic model say, you know, they did a PI3 kind of P10 and beta together, that's the tumor initiation. You won't even get a tumor. Once the PP tumor established, and at the same time you establish that the, the immune suppressive tumor microenvironment, you need uh, help with the immunotherapy. That's what I'm saying here. So PI3 and beta plus the PD1 blockade, you do, you know, you see the control of this and you see 100% regression, I mean, sorry, 50% of the tumor completed re regression and uh, the re-challenge re day. So meaning that they sort of cure. And then, so now let me just complete this. So the, here is sort of like a, in a re more recent history, you guys all know that way later, I you know, first characterized a PI3 times beta selective drug as anti cancer agent. Um, and then the isoform selective 
inhibitor, first one was data, was isolated, which is for B cell lymphoma. Because um, you can, because the PI trepanase data is essential for B cell, um, you know, B cell receptor testosterone signal. You just kill the B cells, and the B cell can be regenerated. It's okay. So that was, you know, um, you don't really find the PI trepanase data mutation in the B cell lymphoma. And then after that, there's a do do this it, which is data gamma is also also for lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, um, later, now 2019, it's the albulisib approved for breast cancer with pic 3 ca mutation. And then, and then our team contributed a lot for this one. But this is approved. And then there is sort of significant overall survival benefit, but it's not robust. It's sort of, I would say, modest. It can be better, you know. So what? The based on our recent, so it's still under revision. We're going to send it back. Uh, this manuscript is PI trepanase. This is another new MOA. Why we target the PI trepanase beta? So that in the future we think that's really the PI trepanase isoform inhibitor plus immunotherapy. It's immunotherapy, not all the PD one PD always. You know, different kind of immune modulatory. This, this, this. I will talk about this. Uh, so in the future, I think that's the that's the way to go. Okay, so uh, let's talk about markets. Uh, so the global market, I guess, I guess you guys all know that in the cancer is sort of hundred billion, you know, dollars in this is growing, and the growth rate is about this. This is from that um, site website. Uh, more specifically, can deficient cancers. So here we just, you know, eight major cancer types we looked and we think it's about like 12, 120K new cases each year. And this is all by genetic gene mutation. And we are not counting by reduced expression, protein modification loss of this. It's very hard to, to sort of the confirm that kind of loss of P10. So this is a more definitive. So that representative already 9.3 billion per year in the US market only. If you count worldwide, I think that it's substantially higher or greater number. So this is the market and each number uh, we have, you know, citations like the one, two, three, nine, there's each number have, has their sort of source. Um, okay, so I just do not want to, so like a, now just uh, sum, summarize that what I said. So our science, we have really um, deeper understanding and the biological dependency on the PIP kind of beta in P10 deficient tumors and other diseases as well. And the synergy of this inhibition with cancer immunotherapy, the cancer immunotherapy, I showed you PD1 sometimes has to be um, innate immune modulators, not all adaptive immuno checkpoint blockade, say. And the GEO has established platforms and systems for drug discovery, development, as well as biomarkers development. So we need a new biomarkers. When we talk the PI2 times beta, we need a new biomarkers. So that's what we are developing as well. And the major milestones. And our team, my team and Tom Roberts lab, and this, we all together, we have uh, received over 20 millions of funding from government and nonprofit agencies. I list here all one or 35 or, you know, um, four projects and uh, stand up to cancer and all this. Um, this is academic activities. Um, our team. So team and then it's me and the Tom where the co-founders. Bill Kearns is very uh, senior, very experienced, the regulatory, you know, um, this, and then he's our senior advisor. And uh, Chi Wang is the head of biology and uh, preclinical development. And, uh, and uh, Xiang Yi uh, is head of chemistry and preclinical development. 
So I mentioned the Lou Cantley and the Gordon Freeman because we we worked together on the recent PID candidates, a uh, PID candidate beta invade P10 and the PD1 combination. Uh, he is uh, our collaborator and then co-inventor for that uh, patent. So he's also our SEB member. Uh, this is our this our pipeline. So using our unique free platform and integrated with AI assisted rational design, we ha we have been uh, focusing on developing well differentiated and novel therapeutic agents including both target therapy and immunotherapy. So this is our pipeline and then I disclosed this, I pending disclosure of the other two. So we have three pattern filed. Um, Piatric cancer beta is well in the IND uh, enabling. We want to get the IND submission next year. Um, so that's, we have, we have deeper pipelines. We keep discovering, you know, now we have P10, P3 and beta the entire pathway and the complex on the pathway as well. So, um, and then, so we have we immune modulation and selective solid, solid tumors or hematological malignancies. Um, <clears throat> IP portfolio, and we, I said we have three already uh, filed, one PCT, and this is Dana Farber's, uh, exclusive license to geod uh, that's the so we have we we do have very strong ip portfolio um and then we uh keep growing our ip portfolios and uh, so we have new pattern at dana farber we keep in license them and uh, and at the geod we uh, keep growing our own pipeline okay so the clinical uh, candidate for the PIP candidate beta is GT220. And then, so we, that's what I say that the PIP candidate, hopefully, you know, it's not just um, PIP candidate family selective. It's, 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 this, so this one is, is, and it's also selective and PIP. So, so here is the, the kind of tree, it's the urethane data. And you can see the, the, it's, Target PI3 kinds beta and then some of the mutant uh, PI3K does not touch any of the protein kinases at a 10 micromole dead dose. So it's highly selective. Um, and uh, in terms of activity and in vivo, the 30 mega per kg is uh, already very uh, effective and compared to these other two beta inhibitor. This is um, AstraZeneca piatric kinase beta inhibitor, which is in clinical trial. Okay, so the GT220, and uh, we have completed all this. We uh, recently completed this. So now we have this, we, we, this is a timeline, rough timeline. We're going to hopefully um, submit to the IND September next year. Okay, so that's the the one, you know, the PIT kind of beta, and then we said we we are also developing um, geo immuno oncology drugs, and the reason is, um, you know, you target therapy, but you have immune uh, suppressive microenvironment induced by P10 or P3 or together, so they these tumor cells really drives the um, the the pathway also through P10 PIT kind of beta, they um, they drive the tumor, the formation of pro-tumor immune microenvironment to support tumor growth and, and then metastasis and the therapeutic resistance. So therefore, a rational integration of target therapy, immunotherapy is a key to breakthrough cancer. So we want, if we want to not just reduce, so sort of like reduce tumor growth and then increase survival time, we really want to have sort of curative uh, treatment, at least for some patients. And I think the target therapy, immunotherapy, you know, um, immune checkpoint blockade, and, you know, a PD-1, pd one antibody is fine. And then GEOD is focusing on develop small molecule drugs, IO, to mobilize all these immune cells. 
um, that's what our advantage we can use in we can because of um, we know the mechanism we can develop safe and effective small molecule drugs to mobilize these immune cells. And I give you one example. So this is the uh, and the pipeline on the, and then our this this is um, in vivo thin genetic germ model, tumor model. This is a very immunogenic model. So single agent. This model respond to PD one blockade by itself. This model I can show you respond to this immune modulatory. Um, this small molecule we give only three doses. Uh, here, so this is a control, tumor growth 100%. If we give one mega per kick, and then six out of eight tumor grow, and then two tumor didn't, you no, know, two out of eight didn't grow, but it's low dose, and dose dependent. If we increase to six milligram per kick, 100%, zero mice grow tumor, 100%. Um, so this is rechallenge if they, don't grow tumor, they this we we challenge them. A few months later, we 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 only give three doses. That's it. And then like two or three months later, we re challenge them. We include naive mice age match. If we give them uh, these tumors, they hundred percent, hundred percent grow tumor. And then these mice, eight mice, nothing, no of none of them. So they develop the immune memory. So it's a it's a cure. Uh, so this is the this competition. Yeah, there's a competition, of course. Although um, uh, patient population P10 deficient tumor is is a large population, and then there's no approved therapy uh, to treat this disease. There are handful drugs being developed with indication for P10 deficient. So here I show this early clinical trials of pan 3 k inhibitors. This is the bupolisib, and this is the Genentex GDC, and that inhibits all isoforms of PI3K, class one PI3K, I said. The results are modest, but the severe adver adverse effects, a, the side effect. I wouldn't say side effect because some of this AE developed from on target toxicity because they, they inhibit all the PI3K kinase isoforms are unnecessary, right? If you try to treat, try treat with prostate cancer with P10 deficiency, you really don't need to target that and gamma. So, so that's the early stage. And then there's a three PI3 kinds of beta inhibitors had or have been under clinical investigation. First one, Sanofi is one, and then GSK and AZD. Sanofi, was a very poor PK and then low efficacy and then early termination stopped. Uh, both the GSK and the AZD, they have significant dose limiting toxicities, DLT in the clinic. So the clinical progress is really slow. They're still on that, but they're really slow. And the AZD actually is a dual PI3 kinase beta and a data inhibitor. That's why they have the colitis, they have some you know, the, some of the DLT in the clinic, so it's, it's not really a beta selective inhibitor. GSK seems a beta selective, but this has a very poor efficacy against the PIC kind of beta. It has a very 10 times higher KD against the PIC kind of beta than other PIC kind of beta inhibitors. So none of them are really um, optimal. <laughs> Beyond the PI3 kinase inhibitors, there's other drugs, so like a mTOR inhibitor, AKT inhibitor. mTOR inhibitor actually has some activity, but this modest. There's really no long-term efficacy. And the mTOR, uh, AKT, they have really toxicity. So, and then, uh, and then plus mTOR, they have the feedback loop, activate PI3K, AKT pathway. So there's some uh, disadvantages. Hi, okay, Jane. So, the, the, yeah. the, the time seems. Um, oh, sorry. I, I go quick. So, this, this yeah. again, I just yes. say this. I thought I have more time because I thought at 10 to 10 30, competitive age, uh, competitive edge. So, competitive advantages. So, I will 
innovation I go through that and the PIP can beta is very safe targeting cancer because this we we have done a lot of work and then we delete the PIP can beta or alpha in, in the brain, the liver, breast, prostate, the ovary. So you name all the tissues and the beta seems fine, disposable and then alpha is sort of detrimental. Okay. GT, this I already said it, it's very selective and then combination that I already said it, I just go back. And then this this our geo the developmental cost and then we had a three years to see the money five million. Uh, we already developed three you know patterned project. One is this. So um, so we have I just we have this you know very sort of um, cost effective drug in the compared to other pharmaceutical companies. We made a lot of progress um, with little money, and then so we are. Uh, at this stage, we raising more money to push forward. And uh, this is our business model. It's the sort of partnership based business model. Um, so we play sort of more uh, important roles uh, in major roles in the early stage. And then once into the early stage, we still play. So, so this partnership is here. And then we are also uh, waiting to, um, so the transaction, um, you know, together an IPO stuff um, with, with other companies or ventures or other farmers. Uh, this is perhaps, this is the last slide. Is time okay, Michael? Um, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so this is the um, sort of projections uh, we think. So basically these years we are all spending our debts and then we hope we can have them. Um, uh, you know, in, in some, this is a high level projection uh, sort of illustrates our estimated strong financial performance of GEO over the next maybe three to five years. If reasonable milestones are uh, achieved and the potential IPO in 2026, that, you know, assumption of course uh, include if we have successful PI 200 beta IND finding next year and then, and then we have successful First in human data, uh, sorry. First in human data, um, 2024-25, and a near-term payoff of this, this. So that's what, and then we hope we have some um, funding to support the second and third um, drugs quickly into the IND because they are really ready for the IND enabling stage. Um, I think that's all. I would say thank you. So is that too quick in the last few slides? Any questions? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jing, for the mm -hmm. wonderful talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, um, put that in the chat box or raise your hand. I can unmute you so you can ask um, directly. Yeah, so any should questions? I put it where? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think there is a question that's asking for, um, uh, for the for the PTN deficient patient uh, percentage. I think you already showed one of the slides. Mm -hmm. um, the question is um, because the PI three K is mostly expressed in the breast cancer, but do you think that is the only direction you are focusing right now, or you it's more broad? Because from the percentage, it seems like it's also very broad for some other um, oncology patient as well. Yeah, that's a good question. So. I think it's of course broad, but they in the this study you use model which is a representative model of prostate cancer and breast cancer, and uh, um, we uh, and the other um, paper they publish in melanoma even if you have P10 loss and then you run the resistance to PD1 PDL1 blockade the resistance to uh, BRAF inhibitor or MAC inhibitor then you need a PI finance data that the other tumor models as well. This is from other um, study, other groups. So I think it's broad, but I think we need, do need to test it model by model. You know, but a clinical trial, we can do basket model as well. Um, that depends on the uh, strategic, you know, how do we design the clinical trial and the prostate and breast and uh, quite a big populations already. Do we focus on that or do we do all, you know, like agnostic, you know, cancer, but as long as you have T10 loss, um, that to be determined. 
Very good question. Yes. Yeah, the next question is asking for the P10, the, the, the drug GT228. Uh, so um, it, it, is, is that a only direction? Uh, I mean, um, kind of like small molecule you're trying to push or you try to do a P10 activator? No, P10 activator, we are not doing P10 activator. For P10 deficiency, I have lost. So I, here we have this, the GT220, the first one, we have gt two. 325 GT, you know, we have pipeline. This we are targeting the, the P10 deficient P10 actually beta PI 300 beta pathway. So the first one is GT220. And um, we do we are not doing the activator because P10 is gone. Usually P10 protein is gone. P people try to preserve P10, say, oh, broccoli, you eat a lot more than you know this. Pandophy paper, you have blocker, you can preserve P10, you have increased P10, activate P10. Because um, P10 with P10 is gone, PI300 beta is making it the culprit. You reduce the PI300 beta activity. That's what I think. Yeah, I want a follow up question on that question. So basically, um, is there any way, yeah, as you, sh as you said, you can probably try to put it back. <laughs> Have you tried to use recombinant P10, try to do something for um, like, like the not activation, but like to use recombinant <clears throat> wild type yeah. um, protein, try to restore? Right, so restore the P10, uh, we have not done. The other group, like a Pandophis group, they did the express P10 and then even in the mice, you get a super mice, you know, super mouse P10, and then it's, it's, they become very resistant to, to cancer and then, or that they cause super mice, P10, you know, overdosing P10, it's great. Um, in real, in the, you know, disease treatment, how, you know, that is a challenge, how do you deliver P10 back to the tumor? Um, uh, P10, you know, yeah, so that's, it's a challenge. So um, this, you know, I think a mechanism wise study is really good and then increase T10, is one way if you have really, so you have to know the mechanism of how do you, the P10 loss is because of epigenetic, because of this, if you have genetic deletion, there's no way to uh, recover P10, but uh, maybe you introduce P10, recombinant P10 protein, maybe. Um, if you have epigenetic loss, then you have to look for that mechanism. If you have protein modification, then you're looking for that mechanism. So it's P10 loss through many different mechanisms. So you have to restore P10 is very context dependent. Uh, but when you have lost P10 different level and PI3 times beta activity is higher. So you maybe that one way to modulate that. And then now we found that actually when P10 is gone, PI3 times beta the entire pathway. So we are targeting PI300 beta itself and related components on the pathway. That's our platform and then the, um, the pipeline as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks. The last question is about the, the PI3K is the lipid kinase. And have yes. you thought about using like the product for autophagy related applications, for example, like the Alzheimer's? Very interesting. It is the uh, PI3 kinase and lipid kinase and P10 phosphatase. And we have not tried the other method. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, so if you have any more questions, feel free to leave that in the box so we can connect you uh, with Jean. Uh, thanks, Jean, for the wonderful talk. It's really um, uh, fantastic. Um, okay. Yeah, Thank have a good you. night. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks. Okay, so that's it, Michael? Yeah, that's it, that's it. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, for hosting this yeah. event. Thank you. Thanks for participating. Okay. Okay, uh, okay everyone. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it tonight. I'm really glad to have so many brilliant uh, startups and investors in both the United States and China. If you have any interest in any of this company, feel free to contact us. You can... Um, see our info um, email address in the chat box. Um, either connect QBay or BCIC is fine. I think um, 
if, if Imi is in the uh, in, 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 in the in the panelists, please uh, key in the contact of BCIC as well. So we'll uh, have more, uh, both QB and BCIC will have more event and coming in the future, focusing on biotech, entrepreneurship and investment. Uh, so please stay tuned. Um, bye everyone. Have a good night and see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.